Good afternoon. My name is Javad Saleh Isfahani. I am the Kuwait Foundation uh, Visiting uh, Scholar at Middle East Initiative, the uh, organization that's hosting this event. I want to welcome you to this second part of the uh, study group on the politics and economics of transition in the Middle East. The purpose of this series is to deepen the understanding of uh, the members of the Harvard community and the uh, public about the uh, deeper forces, economics and politics that have shaped and are shaping uh, transition and change in the Middle East. Our next meeting in the series will be in October, on October 9. Uh, so we won't have any more uh, talks this month. At that time, Professor Robert Springborg of the Naval Postgraduate School will be speaking about obstacles to Egypt's economic development. Our speaker today is Professor Raghi Assad of University of Minnesota and the Economic Research Forum in Cairo. He's a friend and a colleague from long time back. Uh, he's going to be talking about making sense of the Arab labor markets, the enduring legacy of Arab dualism, of dualism. And if anyone can make sense of the Arab labor markets, it would be Raghi Assad. Uh, he has uh, devoted much of his long and very productive career to doing just that. He's done that by collecting survey data in several countries and by writing and training researchers. The data he's collected in Egypt, Jordan, and now in Tunisia, coming in Tunisia since 1988, are the gold standards for survey data in the region and are the basis for dozens of dissert PhD dissertations, numerous research papers, and have filled in journals and conferences that I've attended. It's a lot of work that's being done on uh, Middle East using data that Raghi uh, has personally collected from fundraising all the way to uh, putting the data on the web so people can use it. He's been a pioneer also in making survey data available, something that has been guarded for decades by Middle Eastern governments, but now suddenly is becoming available. Much of what he's uh, talking about today will be based on uh, that data. Uh, I've asked him to speak for about 40 minutes, and then we will have questions and answers. And I want to ask you, if you want to leave after the talk, to please leave quietly so we can uh, keep uh, the momentum as we go to the next part of the talk. Radhi Assad, please. Well, thank you very much, Javad, for this wonderful introduction. I, uh, um, I've been working with Javad a long time, and we've been co-authors and, and partners in many projects, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I guess I was giving a talk the other day about making sense of development in Egypt, and I put uh, in, in front of the, the making sense, I put a possibly futile attempt to make sense. So hopefully this is not going to be a futile attempt. Um, so th there are a number of well-known stylized facts about uh, Arab labor markets. I oscillate between MENA and Arab, but uh, I think I'm talking about particularly Arab labor markets uh, that we, we are quite familiar with. We, we know that there is uh, Arab labor markets are characterized by an oversized public sector. Uh, and generally, the corollary of that is that we have a very a rather small formal private sector that is anemic and dependent on the public sector for its, uh, for its welfare. Uh, Arab countries are characterized by very large investments in human capital, in particular in education. Uh, some of the, the fastest increases in educational attainment in the world, and we'll see some documentation of that. Uh, but also in pursuit of the wrong education. Uh, often it is a pursuit of credentials rather than skills. And if you look at the quality of that education as measured, for example, by international tests, uh, tends to be quite poor. Uh, 
So, so there is a clearly a, a misinvestment in human capital, large investments, but not directed in the right in the right way. And there's also a misallocation of human capital, much of it being trapped in this large public sector in unproductive employment, <coughs> uh, kind of excessive employment in the public sector, and therefore low returns, especially social returns to human capital uh, from a macro perspective. Um, we also know that there are uh, very low and uh, uh, female labor force participation rates, but the part that I think I want to focus on today is that there are also stagnant participation rates, despite this very rapid increase in education, uh, and uh, even though we know that participation, uh, especially in the Arab world, has tended to uh, increase significantly with education. So there is this, this puzzle of why is it stagnant over time. And then finally, the best known uh, stylized facts on Arab labor markets is the high youth unemployment, and that's probably what you hear about the most, uh, and, and this uh, sense that there is a lot of job queuing going on, and particularly for those public sector jobs. Uh, and, and, and it's unemployment among the educated, which is uh, also somewhat unusual, where unemployment tends to be, in other instances, concentrated among the low-skilled. So I'm going to argue that essentially all of these stylized facts, can be explained by one fundamental uh, uh, reason or by my one fundamental cause uh, with uh, uh, some nuances around, uh, around that. But, but essentially, I'm going to argue that it is the labor market dualism that results from the use of labor markets for political purposes. The labor market then is used as a tool of political appeasement in the context of the social contract that most Arab governments have, have in a sense, implicitly negotiated with their uh, societies. Uh, and that social contract is often referred to as the authoritarian bargain. So the authoritarian bargain is, you can think of it as an implicit deal where government, authoritarian governments that don't want their populations to question their authority uh, cannot only use repression as a way to stay in power, so they have to uh, appease politically influential groups, and they do so by providing jobs in the bureaucracy and the security services, as well as providing a bunch of other uh, state-sponsored services and benefits. Uh, so, uh, and what, what do we mean by politically significant groups? Mostly it's the middle class. So educated young people become a very important, uh, or educated people in general become an important constituency. But in some countries, uh, like in the Gulf countries, it's all nationals, all citizens uh, are part of this bargain. Uh, and in, in an other, other countries, it's important sects or tribes or clans that are key to the regime. So for instance, in Jordan, it's the East Jordanians. Uh, uh, in, in Syria, it is the Alawites, etc. So, uh, so the argument essentially is uh, you have uh, the ability for these governments to do that, uh, to be able to uh, 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 buy the quiescence of their populations through primarily using the labor market as a mechanism to do that, and public employment particularly, is because they have continued access to rents from uh, oil and, uh, and, other, uh, and, and other minerals. And, if, and, th and those rents either accrue directly to the government or often indirectly through remittances and aid, uh, but par particularly through aid from other uh, rich governments. So, so that you can think of government employment as one of the primary mechanisms in which uh, governments who have access to these rents have been able to distribute the rents uh, to the, the groups that they feel are politically significant. Now, it's true that many governments since the 1980s have uh, seen an erosion in their uh, in the in the, in the rent uh, rent base that they have. Uh, so oil prices have gone down. Many countries have uh, mostly run out of oil. The problem, however, is that while this has eroded that social contract, and of course the erosion, we we saw the ultimate result of that erosion of the social contract is the explosions of the Arab Spring. But the, uh, I'm arguing that the labor market structure that those social contracts resulted in, that dualism where you have a favored public sector, that is where people are compensated at higher than the market clearing level, uh, 
uh, uh, is one that creates a permanent segment, a segmentation that is enduring. So this is why I, I, I titled this the enduring legacy of, uh, of dualism. So uh, the other way is that also the way that the erosion of the social contract has occurred as the fiscal crisis uh, 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 advanced is that the uh, governments attempted to protect people who are already inside the system. So anybody who had a government job kept it. Anybody who had subsidized housing kept it. If you had access to subsidized commodities through a ration card, you kept it. But it's those who are knocking at the door who are coming in to try and obtain these things who feel like they were el they're eligible and now we have it's our turn. Those are the ones who have been excluded. So the entire cost of the erosion of the social contract was shifted onto these young people uh, who uh, then became the, the, the seeds of the... Um, uh, of, the, of the Arab Spring revolutions. So, um, so my argument is that the, the, the dualism that results in the labor market structure drives behavior until today, and it drives behavior in both what, uh, what sort of, uh, how do you allocate uh, uh, human capital in the economy, but also what kind of human capital you acquire. And that's probably the more, ser the, the, probably the more serious message which is it shapes the type of human capital people are investing in. And that, and as we know, human capital is one of the longest lived assets in an economy. You invest in human capital and it lasts with you for 60 years. So if you make a mistake or an error in your investment in human capital, you pay for it for a very long time. And so you get an enduring effect. Now, uh, so, so I'm going to basically argue, uh, put a very simple model together where I'll show you that if public sector wages and in this case, we have to think of this as, uh, in broader terms than simply wages, a total compensation package that people receive in the public sector, which includes job security, includes benefits, includes uh, uh, other things that, that the public sector provides more over and above what the private sector would provide. If these are set at, at above the market clearing level and certain groups are eligible and others are not, then those groups are going to be uh, uh, have an incentive to queue for those public sector jobs and to um, and and uh, and as a result we have uh, a, as they queue for these jobs you create misallocation because you have all this unemployment but also you get once they get the jobs you get uh, uh, this human capital being trapped in unproductive public employment now. Um, as a corollary, and I'm not going to speak so much about that, but it's this kind of the dependent, uncompetitive uh, uh, structure of the form of private sector. And there's been actually uh, some work uh, by some uh, uh, scholars recently explaining the uh, uh, kind of the, econo the economics of the Arab Spring by the failure of the private sector to uh, develop independently from, from the state in, in most Arab countries and therefore provide an alternative to that public sector employment. Um, now, uh, so, okay, so let me just, I'm not going to, I'm an economist, but I'm not going to do too much economics. This is a very simple uh, economic model, and I know mo many of you are not economists, but it's just to suggest that when you have uh, basically private sector labor demand here, you add to it a public sector labor demand uh, here, and if this is the labor supply curve, you get a market clearing wage, which is W star. So technically, if you have uh, uh, the private sector paying that market clearing wage, then employment would be around here, around this level here. However, the public sector is paying more than that wage. And so people say, OK, uh, I'm not able to necessarily get a public sector job at that wage, but there is a probability attached to my being able to get it. And so I'm going to. Uh, uh, estimate what that probability is, and my expected wage is going to be somewhere between the market clearing wage, which the private sector is, is willing to pay, and the government wage, which the government is paying, but those jobs are rationed. And if I queue, I will expect, if I ha get that probability, I will expect the wage WE, which is around here. Now at that wage WE, the private sector will hire less people, so there will be reduced employment in the private sector. And the public sector would hire this many people, which is what, what they would have hired. But the, uh, and there's going to be a group of people 
that are queuing for public sector jobs. So this is showing the incentive to queue when there is a segmented labor market that is paying higher than. Now, if you think about that in a dynamic sense, this is static. Think about it in a dynamic sense where then people are seeing that uh, in order to get that probability of getting a, pro a public sector job, they need to acquire certain uh, qualifications. Then they start investing in those credentials that allow them to increase this probability of getting a government job. And that's where the investment in credentials uh, uh, and the kind of human capital. And so you play the, the game uh, over an extended period of time, you get a distortion in investments in human capital. So you can ask, okay, well, but we know that that's not the only thing that's happening. We know that there is a demographic phenomenon which is called the youth bulge, and that is probably what's causing this uh, large supply in young people who are uh, therefore not being able, not being absorbed in the economy and are, and are frustrated. And and it's true that MENA ha or MENA and the Arab countries in general have experienced one of the most pronounced versions of the youth bulge uh, in the world. However, if you compare the MENA youth bulge to youth bulges in South Asia, in Southeast Asia, and even in East Asia 20 years earlier, you find that MENA is not that special. So in my view, uh, as far as demographics are concerned, they're not enough to explain what we, the, the stylized fact. However, that they are a complicating factor and they clearly exacerbate the problems that are caused by the uh, structure of the labor market. So, so let me get, provide you some of the evidence for what I'm talking. This says oversized public sector. So this is the first stylized fact. And, and I'm sorry if uh, the, the, this doesn't look very clear, but uh, the bars on top are Middle East and North Africa, followed by uh, Latin America, followed by Sub-Saharan Africa, OECD. Uh, and this shows the share of uh, expenditure on the government wage bill as a share of total expenditures by the government, as, uh, and, and the, the blue one is as a share of GDP. And by, by, if you look at that, the, the only, if you look at just the central government, clearly MENA uh, has the highest share of expenditures on the public sector wage bill uh, in the world, even more than the OECD, which is rich countries typically have larger governments. Um, uh, if you look at, and there is a sample of 12 countries. If, the, the, if you look at general government, which is a smaller sample of, of, uh, of uh, six countries, uh, you still have very high shares and only rivaled by the OECD, which has a similar share of public wage bill to GDP. So the, the evidence is that a lot of money is spent on wages, but it's primarily because a lot of people tend to be in, in government employment. It's not necessarily because they pay government workers uh, 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 excess, an excessive amount. So, so if you look at uh, the ranges of the proportion of the workforce that is in the public sector, uh, it ranges from 14% in Morocco to 40% in Jordan, but clearly uh, quite high by international standards. Among comparable countries uh, that mostly are middle income uh, to upper income countries, you have China being the highest at 29%. Now, the rates that you see here of uh, employment in government for the Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia or, uh, uh, or Qatar or UAE, those are for the entire workforce. Now, if you limit that just to the nationals, you'll see how much more important the government is. So this is 87% of employed nationals in uh, Qatar are working for the government. Uh, Kuwait, it's 86%. Saudi Arabia, 72%. So, so clearly, there are, there's a, mar a labor market there where it says if you're a national, you get your job in the government, and if you're uh, the private sector relies on uh, foreigners for, um, uh, for its uh, workforce. Now, in terms of the size of the, uh, the, the relative size of the public and private sectors, now, not all countries provide enough information to identify formal employment uh, in the private sector. Uh, however, when, when we do have, for instance, West Bank and Gaza, we're not able to distinguish between formal and informal employment. Among expats in UAE, we're not able to distinguish between informal and uh, formal employment in the private sector. But if you see the red bars, those are essentially the share of the formal private sector in total employment, and it's very tiny. 
compared to either the public or the informal sector. And, and it's largest in Jordan, but still even there, it's, it's, it's quite small. Now, um, the, 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 way, the information on wages is a little bit more difficult to get at. And I found this one source but, uh, that, that shows that the wage rate, and if you uh, public, uh, compare to the private sector, the pub public sector in MENA is paying about 130%, so 30% higher than the private sector. I, the, the data on that varies from, from country to country, but at, at the very least, uh, in the case of Egypt and, uh, and Jordan, the data that we have indicates that for men, uh, public and private wages are similar, except the benefits, of course, and the non-wage benefits in the public are significantly higher. So that even though they might get, for men, similar monetary wages, uh, the, the, the benefit packages and the job security, et cetera, makes public sector uh, employment much more attractive. Uh, in the case of women, because the private sector discriminates against women and the public sector does not, there is a big wage gap in favor of the public sector. So women have a much stronger incentive to queue for these public sector jobs uh, in, in Egypt. So, so um, despite the fact that we know that there's been a lot of wage erosion in the public sector, et cetera, it still pays enough, uh, attractive enough wages to attract people. Uh, now, so I looked at uh, opinion survey data. This is from Gallup. Uh, that tells you what is the proportion of youth and adults who express a preference for public sector employment if pay and work conditions were similar. So this is uh, uh, kind of a preference of which sector do you prefer with this pr provision. And you can see that in nearly all countries except for the first three, Lebanon, Sudan, and Morocco, uh, more than 50% prefer public sector employment. In the case of UAE, we're talking about uh, uh, above 80%. And what's interesting is that the preferences of the youth are not that different from the preferences of the older 30-plus uh, group. Uh, in, in, but in many cases, they have a greater preference for public sector employer, employment than their older uh, counterparts. So, uh, so what about the large, this is, says large but distorted investments in human capital. Uh, large, we can show that very clearly by, this is a, a graph showing the number of additional years of schooling that were gained on average between 1980 and 2010. So on average, the population added how many additional years of schooling. Uh, this is from the Barrow and Lee uh, data set, which looks at this all over the world. These are the top 20 countries in the world in terms of, well, I mean, it's interesting that Germany and Botswana are, are, are the top, uh, I, I don't understand about Germany because I thought they were already well educated. But, uh, but in any case, out of those 20 countries, eight are Arab countries, and the ninth one is Iran. And, and uh, so big increases in uh, number, at least quantity, of education over that period. Now, if you look at the, the two countries with, this is the number of years of schooling by cohort of birth. You can see this rapid increase in number of years of schooling, but most importantly, a closing of the gender gap. And in fact, in Jordan, it's the reverse gap has emerged, that, that women are now more educated than men, in, slightly more educated than men in Jordan, and in Egypt they're catching up very fast. And that, that reversal is gonna happen in Egypt as well, if you look at trends in uh, university uh, uh, enrollment, etc. So that's quantity. What about quality? Well, this is uh, data from the uh, TIMS, which is a test, uh, the inter international test in math and science. These are uh, uh, tests that are standardized, uh, or take place in many, many parts of the world, and we have a significant number of Arab countries have, uh, have done those. The blue here is the proportion of students who score in the below low category. So not even low, but we're below low. And the average for the Arab, for the, uh, Arab countries for MENA actually in this case is 54% of students scoring below low. And the, the student scoring uh, in the intermediate category is 
14 percent whereas and the interesting part about this graph is that it looks like the richer the countries the worse you score uh, you have Qatar Saudi Arabia Kuwait with uh, 70 and 80 percent of their students scoring in the below law so clearly there is a problem with uh, the acquisition at least of the, the kinds of skills that people uh, uh, considered to be standard skills uh, uh, worldwide. Now, what about, so they get this education, what do they do with it? So here I'm going to show you about what happens to a recent graduate uh, who is, has a secondary education or above, uh, what happened to them early in the 70s or in the, in, well actually to the early 70s, to uh, and what first job they obtained and versus what what would happen to them in the 2000s so again this is Jordan and this is telling you that if you had secondary education or above throughout the 70s and even up to the mid 80s in Jordan you had a 60 percent chance of getting a government job and then this switched quite dramatically in the mid 80s and you have a huge decline but then stabilizing again at around the 30% chance. And what took over the slack in Jordan is formal private employment. So Jordan was able to expand its formal sector so that it's attracting more and more of the educated workers who would have gone to the uh, uh, public sector otherwise. And uh, uh, now what about Egypt? Let's look at, so this is the situation in Egypt. Again, if you uh, graduated with a secondary degree or above in the 1970s, you had more than a 60% chance of getting a government job. But if you look at Egypt, the formal private employment remained quite flat. You still have a 20% chance of getting a formal private job today as you did in 1970. And what took up the slack in Egypt is informal private employment. So this is essentially people who are employed with no contract, no social insurance, still employed for wages in the private sector, but, uh, but without any of the contract of social insurance. And the reason this contrast between Jordan and Egypt exists is because in Jordan they managed to make uh, uh, formal hi or to make hiring by uh, employers in the formal sector quite flexible. So that if you look at the data more carefully, you would find that in more recent times, the, the, the uh, people employed in the Jordanian private sector are employed on more uh, uh, flexible contracts, temporary contracts, uh, and, and, and the employer doesn't have an obligation to keep them on uh, uh, forever. Yes? Uh, uh, the data stops in Egypt, but uh, at your yeah. 8,000, I was wondering, yes. uh, because of the economic growth that, that happened right before. Yeah, I, uh, I actually, this is from the 2006 survey, the Egypt Labor Market Panel survey, so we stopped at 2005, but we now did the 2012 survey, and it, it looks like it's flattened out a little bit, but it hasn't, it hasn't gone way up. So, so essentially, the, the labor market for educated uh, graduates has shifted quite dramatically. In, in I'm seeing Jordan, Egypt here as exa example countries, but I'm sure the others will be somewhat si similar, where you instead of having those secure, well, uh, uh, well regarded public sector jobs, you're essentially getting either more flexible, more flexibilized private sector jobs in Jordan or informal jobs in Egypt. And this is the kind of informalization story uh, that we're talking about. Now, I did an exercise which you can, uh, one can question, but I, I kind of said, okay, what if we look at create an index of job quality? And the index of job quality includes pay as well as formality and other aspects of the job, like uh, whether it comes with benefits like uh, health insurance and uh, paid vacations, etc. And I was able to uh, uh, create that index for people of uh, different cohorts and generations and this is for the first job again this is the first job they got uh, uh, in their career and you can see that if you're not educated you have low job quality the average job quality is zero that's set at zero if you are low educated you have low job quality but it hasn't changed much you still have low job quality as you go on and especially if you're a woman you have very low job quality if you're an ed a less educated woman However, if you're more educated, you're a secondary and above, your job quality was 
fairly high earlier on, and then you have a, uh, a, a kind of a, a gradual and quite steady decline in job quality over time as those public sector jobs are no longer forthcoming. All right, so this is in terms of uh, the kind of uh, what does education buy you in the labor market and, and the erosion of the value of education. Now I move to the uh, story of female labor force participation. And here uh, we, know the, we know the main story, which is participation in this region tends to be much lower than other parts of the world. So if you look at uh, labor force participation in major regions of the world, MENA comes at the very end with, it started at 22% uh, in 1980-85 uh, and it's gone up to 28% in 2005, 2010. Uh, however, I'm not claiming that the low participation itself is the result of this dualistic structure of the labor market. I think that low participation in MENA has many, many explanations. Uh, the most common, commonly, uh, common explanation is, of course, the impact of culture and, and, uh, and uh, social norms, etc. But others have advanced the explanation of essentially the effect of oil rents in depressing participation, either through kind of increasing reservation wages, oil rents flow to the male member of the household, they can afford to keep their women folk at home, uh, so that's kind of an increased reservation wage sort of argument. Or oil rents change the structure of the economy towards more service-oriented economies, less in terms of tradable goods where women tend to, uh, female jobs tend to be. So there are a number of arguments of why female uh, participation is low. I want to focus instead on why it has not gone up given the dramatic increase in female education. And, and this is the... Uh, so, so again, this is by country. Uh, looking at the participation rates, and don't be fooled by the high participation rates in Kuwait, Qatar, and Bahrain. Those are mostly foreign women who are working there. <laughs> so so it's, uh, uh, if you limit it to nationals, those participation rates will be much, much lower. Um, now, the next graph is a bit of a complicated graph, and, I, and bear with me a little bit, because I'm trying to trace, and I've uh, and this is my attempt to trace the link between participation and education. So if you look at that first graph towards the left over there, you have education increasing, even if you don't see the words, I know that those in the back will not see them. You have education increasing from kind of illiterate all the way to uh, the highest level. And you can see that uh, in Egypt and Jordan, participation rises dramatically right after the secondary level. Once you reach secondary education, your participation goes up sub substantially. But if you look at the two bars, the educated women's participation has declined significantly in Egypt between 98, 2006, and 2012. You get a declining participation among educated women. Now, what you need to keep in mind as you look at these uh, pictures is that uh, the, the population is shifting to the right as the population gets more educated. So if nothing was happened to participation rates, you would expect that just simply the mere <coughs> shift of the population towards more educated groups, you're going to get higher overall participation. And in fact, you don't. You get overall participation is quite flat. Now, uh, and if you do look especially at employment as opposed to participation, remember participation includes both employment and unemployment. If you look at employment, uh, uh, it's, it's even flatter, and a lot of those educated women are actually unemployed. That's the difference between first first figure and second figure. Now, what about wage employment? Well, wage employment tends to be very low for less educated women. And so most of the le less educated women are employed, self-employed or unpaid family workers. And wage employment tends to be uh, mostly among the educated. And that's why those bars are about the same size uh, for the educated. And then the last uh, panel is public wage employment. And you can see that most of that wage employment happens to be in the public sector. So when the public sector then reduces its employment, as we saw in the previous graphs, participation is bound to decline. So the explanation of the declining participation among educated women is directly related to access to public sector jobs. And in fact, private sector did not take up the slack that uh, was created by 
So, so a lot of women essentially become unemployed for a while when they don't find public sector jobs, and then after they lose hope and they leave the labor force rather than wait for a private sector job. Men don't have a choice, they have to work, so they get into the informal sector. So the informalization we've seen uh, in the case of Egypt is very much a male-dominated phenomenon, and, and women would uh, uh, instead uh, pull out of the labor force. Now, the, the story in, in Jordan is very similar, uh, and you can see the kind of the declining trend in participation in the public sector being reflected in these other uh, curves. And very similar story in Tunisia, flat participation rates despite dramatic increases in education because of a decline in participation uh, among educated women. So sorry about the complicated graphs, but I thought I needed to show the, the, the progression from labor force participation to public employment uh, and how, it, how that works. So essentially the story for uh, female labor force participation is that uh, public employment opened up those opportunities for women. However, those were, uh, so there was that, like a, a boost in participation during the period of state-led uh, development. And as the public e sector pulls out, uh, there is no alternative for them but to go back home, so to speak. Okay, what about the story on unemployment? And unemployment, as you know very well, is essentially a youth phenomenon. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, very high among youth and declines dramatically as you go to older ages, with the only exception being Palestinian males. And those are the Palestinian males who are no longer able to get jobs in Israel. And we will see that that, that high unemployment continuing uh, uh, for older ages among Palestinian males is the one exception to the story of uh, rapidly declining unemployment rates uh, uh, as you get above age 30. Now, this is another graph that shows what is the share of the unemployed that are new entrants. That means they have never had any previous employment. And you can see that in many countries, this is in the 80 to 90% range. So we're, we're talking about entry unemployment, unemployment due to the difficulty of getting your first job, but not job loss unemployment, which is the unemployment that we is talked about most if people lose their jobs and they're unemployed until they find their next job. There is very little of that in the region. Most of it is entry, uh, entry unemployment. Now, unemployment tends to be very different between males and females, and you can see that uh, uh, in, in, in most countries, female unemployment is much higher, uh, and those are, uh, and I'm going to link that story with the unemployment story with the queuing for public sector job story, and if women, their, mo their only option or their, uh, is essentially to work for the public sector, they queue for those jobs, and then once they get beyond a certain age, they drop out, so you can see the unemployment picture being much more uh, uh, problematic for in the case of women. Um, now, what about the link between unemployment and education? And here again, we see that uh, the, the idea that unemployment tends to go up with education in most cases with a few exceptions. So unemployment is fairly low among the primary educated, but uh, once you get to the secondary level, and that's the level at which you become eligible for government employment in many countries, it goes, it, shoot, it shoots up. Uh, the exceptions are Palestinian males, again, where unemployment is highest among the less educated, and for some reason, Syrian females, and I haven't come up with an explanation for that. So, um, now, uh, in terms of how much, how long people have to queue to get into their first job. Uh, this is data on years since graduation for youth in different countries uh, up to the point in which 75% of youth are employed. So it takes, uh, in the West Bank and Gaza, three years if you are university graduates for 75% of youth uh, who graduated to be employed. But among secondary educated youth, it takes nine years. So these are very long uh, waiting periods to get into your first job by any standards. And, uh, and then for 90% of youth, they're kind of 
uh, even much longer. So it just tells you that the transition from school to work is a very slow one, and it takes many, many years because of that uh, queuing phenomenon that we looked at. So a lot of the unemployment, essentially, it's young people waiting for that first job. They're waiting for the first formal job, which is worth queuing for. If that formal job doesn't materialize, they either just take an informal job or if, in the case of women, drop out altogether. Yeah. Yeah, so if you take 100% of youth graduate in a certain year, how many years does it take for three quarters of them to become employed? So 25% are still unemployed after three years, is what this is saying. Um, That's surprising. I mean, after nine years, we expect people to be unemployable. Yes, well, I mean, it. Uh, I think what what you have, I mean, I, I'd be interested in seeing this data uh, uh, disaggregated by sex because a lot of the uh, women are probably sometimes never going to get in, into a job. So that may, yeah. may raise those averages a bit. Um, all right. So to kind of try and <laughs> explore that link between youth unemployment and government employment. I mean, most people would say we need more government employment to reduce youth unemployment. And I'm arguing that more government employment will, in fact, could increase youth unemployment because they provide greater incentive to queue for these jobs. Uh, so, so I decided to kind of explore that relationship by looking at census data. Uh, we have this wonderful uh, uh, project uh, uh, called IPUMS, which provides you uh, census data from many countries, 10% samples where you can look at the micro data, and kind of try to link, okay, what if I plotted youth unemployment rate versus the percent employment in the public sector in your province or in your government? So I'm kind of assuming that the labor, extent of the labor market is your government, which may or may not be a good assumption. And I'm saying, uh, how does the unemployment, youth unemployment rate relate to uh, the proportion of jobs in your government that are public sector jobs? And you can see that in nearly all these cases, except for Palestine, there is a positive relationship between the two. If unemployment and if, if gov government jobs actually reduced, you'd see the negative relationship. And, and so now, of course, you tell me, but you're not correcting for all kinds of other things. Uh, there may be that you know, uh, those governments that have more public employment also have more educated people, uh, and they tend to have more unemployment. So this is what you're seeing here. So what we're doing next is looking at this in a multivariate uh, framework. So this is a probit regression where I look at a sample of all economically active individuals 15 to 29. And I have data from Egypt, two different censuses, Iraq, Jordan, Morocco, Palestine, uh, uh, two different censuses. The, the dependent variable is uh, unemployed or not. And then we have a whole bunch of explanatory variables is the public sector employment rate in your government or province, but then controlling for a whole bunch of other things, and, and uh, as well as a bunch of interactions between, between these things. So to try and get at what is the link between unemployment rate for youth and public sector employment controlling for the characteristics of the province in terms of infrastructure, uh, prevalence of education, your own education, your own age, etc. Now we get from that, I get a bunch of uh, estimated relationships. These are like simulations. So for a particular individual with a particular profile living in the average kind of place, this is the relationship between their unemployment rate and the proportion of government uh, employment in their government. And this variable is uh, standardized. So zero means the mean, one means one standard deviation above the mean, two means two standard deviations above the mean. And, and you can see here, if my presumption is correct, those curves have to be upwardly sloping. So essentially there is a positive relationship between, uh, and, and in the case of Egypt, there's not strong evidence for that. Uh, there is some, in some cases, for primary educated uh, males, you have a positive relationship. 
for university educated females you have a positive relationship but for others you don't have a strong relationship however if you look at uh, Iraq you have a much more uh, uh, much more evidence for a positive relationship between the two so queuing is is definitely present in Iraq for males and for females but at lower levels and if you look at finally Jordan and Morocco you also have uh, uh, a positive relationship, at least in Jordan, for females who tend to be queuing, and in Morocco also for females who are, tend to be queuing more. Now, this is contingent on my assumption that uh, your labor market is your province. However, if you're queuing for a national labor market, if you're more university educated, maybe it's not just your province you're looking at, but you're looking at employment in the capital and in elsewhere, then, then I think this relationship would be weaker in that case. So at least there's prima facie evidence that government employment tends to drive the skewing behavior, which results in the high unemployment. So I'm going to just uh, uh, sum up. So, so I've argued that the long-standing long practice of using public sector employment as a tool of political appeasement has, di has distorted the structure of the labor market by creating the segmentation resulting in not only misallocation of human capital, which is what you would expect when you have a distortion, but also investments in the wrong, wrong kinds of human capital over time, which I think is the, on, the, on a dynamic, long-term framework, the more serious problem. Um, and, and, and you find that a lot of the uh, studies that look at the kind of, what is the impact of all this investment in education in the Arab world on, you know, let's say growth, economic growth or GDP, you find very low returns. And I argue that that's one of the reasons why. And you also have this misallocation in the sense of a lot of uh, human capital is wasted through this queuing uh, for, for public sector work. Um, now, my argument is that du the dualism uh, uh, persists despite the, despite the erosion in public sector hiring. Uh, and in fact, the tendency now of populist regimes that post-Arab Spring to want to solve the problem of youth unemployment by creating more government jobs is likely to strengthen that dualism even more. So I think this is something we have to be very careful about in terms of uh, moving forward. Um, and and, and the, 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 the other argument I made is that the erosion of that social contract was done on the back of youth uh, in order to protect the, the incumbents, the insiders, which is very different from the way transition, for instance, happened in... Uh, Eastern, Europe, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, where the people, the older generation, the older workers were the ones who bore the brunt of the transition, and the youth got a lot of new opportunities. It's exactly the opposite of the nature of the transition we have in the Arab world. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much.